From Palo Alto, California, it's Cube Conversations with John Furrier. Hello, and welcome to our special Cube Conversation here in Palo Alto, California. I'm John Furrier, co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media and co-host of theCUBE. I'm here with Fo Huang, who's the co-founder and chief strategy officer of Data Torrent. Great to see you again, welcome back. Thank you so this much, Cube conversation. So you're now yeah. the chief strategy officer, which is code words for, you were the CEO and co-founder of the company, you bring in a pro, Guy Churchwood, we know very well, former EMC or yeah. uh, real pro. Yeah. Gives you a chance to kind of like get, get down and dirty into the organization and, and, and get back to your roots and kind of look at the, the big picture. Um, great management team. Talk about what your background is, because I think I want to start there, because you have an interesting background, former Yahoo executive, we've talked before. Take a minute to talk about your background. Yeah, sure. You know, I think uh, I was, I, I'm just one of those super uh, lucky engineer. Uh, I got uh, involved with Yahoo way early in 1996. I think I was the fifth engineer or so. And uh, I stayed there for 12 years, ended up running about close to 3,000 engineers, mm -hmm. and had the chance to really uh, experience the whole growth of the internet. Um, we built out hundreds of sites worldwide. And so all of our engineering team developed all of those websites uh, throughout the world. You must have a tear in your eye on how Yahoo ended up. We don't want, we won't want to <laughs> yes. go there. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about that. But you know, if folks that are that don't remember the Yahoo during the Web 1.0 days, it was the beginning of a revolution. And I kind of yeah. see the same thing happening with blockchain and, and what's going on now. A whole new Wild West is happening. But back mm -hmm. then, you couldn't buy off the shelf. You had to certainly buy servers, but the software, you guys were handling kind of a first generation use case. That's right. And folks may or may not know, but Yahoo really was the inventor of Hadoop. Yep. Um, doing Hadoop at large scale, obviously, you know, MapReduce written by Google, but the rest yep. is, you guys were deploying a lot of that stuff. So you had to deal with scale and write your own software for big data before it was called big data. That's exactly right. You know, it's interesting because uh, originally we, we thought that our job was really, f you know, customer facing website and all of the data crunching and massaging that we would actually be able to use enterprise software to do that. And uh, very quickly, we learned that at the pace of scale of data that we were generating, that we really couldn't use that, that software, and uh, we were kind of on our own. And so we had to invent approaches to do that. And uh, the thing we knew a lot was commodity servers on racks. Yeah. And so we ended up saying, well, so how do I solve this big data processing problem yeah. using that hardware? And so, you know, it didn't happen overnight. It took you know many years of doing it right, doing it wrong, yeah. and fixing it. But you start to iterate around how to do distributed processing across yeah. many you know hundreds of servers. To it's solve interesting. A Yahoo had the same same situation, and ultimately Amazon ended up having because exactly. they were a pioneer. And right. people dismissed Amazon Web Services like, oh, it's just you know hosting and That's you know right. bare metal on the cloud. But really, what's interesting is that you guys were hardening and operationalizing big data. That's right. So I got to ask you the question, and because this is this is kind of a more of a geeky computer science concept, but batch processing has been around since the mainframe, and that's become normal. Yep. Databases, et cetera, software. Yep. But now, over the past you know eight years in particular, as big data and unstructured data has proliferated in massive scale, certainly now with the Internet of Things, you see it booming. Yep. This notion of real-time data in motion. So you have two paradigms out there. Um, Batch processing, which is well known, and yep. <laughs> yep. You, know, you, know, you know, data in motion, which is essentially real time. Yeah, I said self-driving cars. I mean, the evidence is everywhere where this is going, and yep. real time is not near real time. That's right. In nanoseconds, people want results. That's right. This is a fundamental data challenge. What's your thoughts on this, and how does this relate to how big data will evolve for customers? I think you're exactly right. You know, I think as uh, as big data came and people were able to process data and understand it better and d derive insights from it, uh, very quickly for competitive reasons, they find out that they want those insights sooner and sooner. They, didn't, they couldn't get it soon enough. And so you have this opposing trends of more and more data, but yet at the same time, faster and faster insight, and you know, where does that go? And, and I think the, you know, when you really come down to it, people don't really want to do batch processing. They do batch processing because that was the technology that they have. If they have their way, they don't want to just, you know, information is coming into their business. Customers are interacting with their products constantly, 24 by seven. So those events, if you will, that are giving them insights are happening all yeah. the time, yeah. except 
for a long time, they store it into a file. They wait till midnight and then yeah. they process it overnight. Um, more and more, they n there are now capabilities yeah. in memory distributed to do that processing as it comes in. And you know, that's one of the big motivation for uh, forming data torrent. And you know, I want to get the data torrent in a minute, but I want to get some of these trends because I think they're important to kind of right. put together the two big pieces of the puzzle, if you will. One is, you mentioned batch processing in real time. Yeah. You know, the, the companies historically have built their infrastructure and their operations, IT and whatever, around that, how storage was procured right. and right. deployed. And now with IOT and the edge of the network becoming huge, it's a big deal. So data in motion, it's yep. pretty much well agreed, it's agreed right. upon amongst most of the smart people this is a big issue. Yep. But let me throw a little wrench in the equation. Cloud computing kind of changes the security paradigm. Yes. There's no perimeter anymore, so there's no door you can secure, no firewall model. Once you get in, you're in, and that's where we're seeing a lot of attacks on ransomware and a lot of cyber attacks. It's, the penetration is everywhere. And yep. Now there's APIs and everything. So when you bring cloud into it, and you bring in the fact that you got data in motion, what is the challenge for the customer? How do top architects get their arms around this? What's the solution? What's the what's the what's your vision on that? Well, I, I'll start by saying it's a hard problem, you know, and I think you're absolutely right. I think we're still in the phase where the problems are very visible about how do you solve this. I think I think we're still as an industry still figuring out how to solve it because you're right. Uh, the security uh, issues, you know, security is not this one point tool, it's, it's an entire ecosystem process for doing that. And the cloud opens up all, all of those uh, opportunities for, for fraud and so on. So it's still an ongoing challenge. I think, um, you know, the, the trend of, of memory becoming cheaper and cheaper so that things are done more in memory and less in storage could actually help a bit on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but overall, uh, security, uh, internal, external processes are It's a moving still, train. Yeah, it's a moving. So let me exactly. ask you about the, the big other trend to throw on top of this. This is really kind of where you see a lot of the activity, although some will claim that the app stores are not seeing as many apps now as they used to be, but certainly in the enterprises, massive growth in application development. That's right. So ready-made apps with DevOps and cloud have built a whole culture of infrastructure as code, which is essentially saying that I'm going to build apps and make the infrastructure kind of invisible. You're seeing a lot of apps like that, called ready-made apps, however you want yes. to call it, those yes. are the things. So yes. how are you guys at D uh, Data Turret handling and supporting that trend? We are, we're, in the we're right smack in the middle of exactly that trend. You know, one of the theses that we had was that big data is hard. You know, Hadoop is hard. Uh, you know, Hadoop is now 12 years old and you know, Lots of people are using Hadoop, trying Hadoop, but yet yeah. it's still not something that is fully operationalized and easy for everybody. And, and I think that part of that is, you know, big data is hard, uh, distributed processing is hard, how to get all that working. So there were two things we were focusing on. So one was the real time thing, but the other one was how do we make this stuff a lot easier to use? So we focused a lot on building tools uh, on top of the open source engine, if you will, to kind of make it easy to use. But the other one is exactly that, ready-made apps. You know, as we continue to learn in working with our customers and starting to see the patterns, you know, putting kind of bigger functional block together so that it's easier to kind of build these big data applications mm -hmm. at this next layer. Yeah. You know, uh, machine learning, rule engines, whatever or not, but how do you piece that together in a way that is 80% done so that the customer only has you know, a little bit the last mile. So you guys want to be the tooling for that? Yeah, I, I think so, and I think, um, I think you, you have to. I mean, this stuff, you know, if you have to kind of go through the whole six layer of, of what it takes to get the final mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, business value out, you, you're not going to have the, the, the skill set to do it. You know? So the more we can abstract and get it to the top, the better. For every company's got their own um, DNA. Intel has Moore's Law, you're the co-founder of Data Turret. What's the DNA of your company as the founder? And tell, I'll talk about what's the, what do employees you try to instill into your culture um, that, that is the DNA that you want to be known for? Interesting, so I, I start out sort of on the technical or, or you know, product side. Actually our DNA is all about ops. Uh, we, we think that, um, especially in big data, there's lots of ways to do prototypes and get some proof of concept going. But getting that to production, to run it 24 by seven, never lose data, that's really, has been hard. And so uh, our, our entire existence is around how to truly build 24 by seven, no yeah. data, fast uh, applications. So 
all of our engineers live and breathe how to how to do that well. You know, ops is, is uh, consistent with with uh, stability, and yeah. it's interesting. You know, Silicon Valley is going through its own transformation around uh, programmers and and the role of entrepreneurship. It's interesting in the enterprise, they've always kind of like, oh, no big deal, because at the end of the day. They need stuff to run at five nines. These are networks, and, and the old saying that Mark Zuckerberg used to have is, you know, move fast and break stuff. They've changed their tune to move fast and be 100% reliable. Yeah. So <laughs> this is the trend that the enterprises have always put out there. Yeah. How do companies stay and maintain that ops integrity, uh, as and still be innovative without a lot of command and control and compliance restrictions? How do they experiment with this the data tsunami that's happening and maintain that integrity? Um, my answer to that is, I, I think as an industry, um, you know, we have to build products and tools to allow for that. I mean, some of that is processes in, inside a company, but I think a lot of that can be productized. You know, you, you, the, the advances in, in that big data processing layer and, and how, to, uh, how to recover, you know, get new containers and do the, all the right things, allow for the application developer not to have to worry about many of those yeah. segments. So, it's, so I, I think technology exists out yeah. there for tools to be developed to, to, to deal with a lot of that. I love talking with the entrepreneurs and you're the co-founder of Data Turret. Uh, talk about the journey you've been on from the beginning. You, know, so you have a new CEO, which, you know, as a CEO, you want to lighten the load up a little bit. It gets bigger, you got to have HR issues, things are happening. You're putting culture in place and trying to scale out and, and get a groove swing. And certainly Uber could have taken a few uh, play tips from your playbook and as bringing in senior management. You did it at the right time. Mm -hmm. But talk about your journey, um, the company, and, and, and what people should know about Data Turn. Well, I think, uh, you know, we, we're just a bunch of guys that are just still trying to make a contribution to the industry. I think we saw an opportunity to, to really help people move towards big data, move towards real-time uh, analytics, and, and really help them solve some really hairy problems that, that they have coming up with data. Uh, um, from a from a skill set and personally, you know, I think uh, you know, kind of my particular strength was really about that initial vision, mm -hmm. uh, be able to kind of build out a set of capabilities, mm -hmm. and and maybe get a first set of you know half a dozen wins and really prove point, but to sort of make it into a you know a machine that that you know has all the right marketing tools and business development tools and so on. Uh, it will be great to be able to bring in someone like Guy, yeah. who has done that many, many times over and has been uh, super successful at that, to take us to the next level. It takes a lot so. of self-awareness too. I mean, you probably had your, your moments where you should stay on, be the CEO, and, but what are you doing now? I mean, because you get down and you can get into the products, are you doing a lot more product tinkering? Are you involved in, obviously, the roadmap? What, what's, your, what's your involvement day to day now? Oh, I, I, I love it, because it's exactly what, uh, what I enjoy most, which is really interacting with customers and users and really continue to hone in on the product market fit by end and continue to understand what are the pain points, what are the issues, and how can we solve it, all coming from uh, not so much a services mentality, but a product mentality. Yeah. You know, how do we really... At the cloud ops, too, I mean, that's yeah. a big area. So what's that's the big right. problem that you solve for the customers? What's the big, big, uh, hairy problem? Really easy, how to productize, how to operationalize this, uh, this data pipeline that yeah. they have yeah. so that it can truly be accepting real live business data that they are getting in and giving them the insight. Been a lot of talk about automation and AI lately. Obviously, it's buzzword. Um, you know, Wikibon just put out a report on called True Private Cloud that shows all the automations actually going at and, and replacing non-differentiated labor, which yeah. actually like racking and stacking gear. Yeah. Yeah. Moving to value, so actually there'll be more employment um, yeah. on that side. But talk about the role of automation in the data world, because if you just think about the, the amount of data that companies like Facebook and Yahoo take in, you need machine learning, you need Absolutely. automation. Absolutely. What is the key to automation in, in a lot of these new emerging areas around large data sets? It's so funny, yesterday I was driving, I was listening to a KQED segment and they were talking about uh, then in its next phase, uh, AI and machine learning is going to do sort of the first layer of all the uh, reporting, right? So you actually have reporters now doing much more sophisticated reporting because there's an AI layer that has a template of what are the questions to answer and they can just spill out all the, all the news for you. Um, <laughs> Paid by cryptocurrency. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
it's, uh, I, think, I think machine learning and AI will be everywhere. Uh, yeah. and, and we will continue to um, learn and, and it will continue to get better at doing more and more things for us so that we get to kind of play at that creative, disruptive layer while it does all the menial tasks. And I think it will it'll, it'll touch every part of, of our civilization. Uh, the technology is getting incredible, the algorithms are incredible, the power, uh, the computing power to, to allow for that is, is getting exponential. So, um, uh, and I think it's super interesting uh, that the, uh, the, the engineers are super interested in it. Um, everything we do now revolves around, you know, when we talk about the analytics layer at, at real time, it's all about machine learning scoring and how to rule rules and all that. Great to have you here on the Cube Conversation. I'll give you the last word. Talk, give a quick plug about Data Turret. What should your customers know about you guys? Why should they call you? Uh, well, uh, you know, we're, we're a company uh, solely focused on uh, bringing big data applications to production. Uh, we, we, we focus on making sure that as long as you understand what you want to do with data, uh, we can make it uh, super fast, super reliable, super scalable, all that stuff. Co-founder of Data Turn here in the Cube Conversation here in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching.